Force Needville. The year is 1800-something, and the place is eastern Tennessee in a world not entirely like our own. The Empire of Knoxville is distracted by engagements to the north, south, and west. This opens the door for the much smaller nation of Kingsport to take a bite out of their rival neighbor. Specifically, they want to capture Sneedville, hang on to it through the winter, and thus secure for themselves a little additional bite of land, the important crossroads and sleepy little valley of Sneedville. Knoxville is currently engaged in negotiations. What they don't realize is the negotiations are a ploy. Kingsport has no intention of honoring. Kingsport has mustered three armies, one in Greenville, one in Jonesville, and one in Rogersville, and launches their attack. Unfortunately for them, these armies move out on the 21st of September, and instead of a blitzkrieg due to mismanagement at the higher echelons, bad omens, nervousness on the part of the troops, their armies do not blitz for the border. They creep for the border. It is more of a stumble krieg. More devastating to their efforts, they have opted to advance the army of Jones to take Sneedville. They have ordered the army of Rogersville to take Bean Station and sweep down to take Morristown. Morristown, an important crossroads, and the second largest city in eastern Knoxvillean territory. The Green Army is slated to move up to Bulls Gap and hold to see what the results of the initial actions are. They are a reserve force. I-40, I-81 are improved roads. There is a major artery that directly connects these two nations, these two capitals, and of course, the Kingsport leadership wants to be safe and snug in their beds. Green's army is ordered to hold something of a mobile reserve. However, remember we said that the armies engaged in a bit of a stumble creed. As you can see, Rogersville is much closer to the border. Rogers' army, due to a lack of communications, lost messengers, what have you, they cross the border on September 24th. On September 24th, Jones's army is still creeping to the south. They will not enter Sneedville until the 28th of September. By then, Roger's army has already secured Bean Station, done a change of leadership, and begins to head down to Morristown. Meanwhile, Green's, arm, Green's army, which took a lot longer to march up from Hot Springs, particularly around from Irwin, they set out, and on the 28th, they finally arrive at Bull's Gap. On the 28th, Sneedville is secured. All Kingsport has to do is hang on to Sneedville, and they will win this campaign. However, due to the inefficiency of this initial invasion, Knoxville had time to respond, and they responded by partitioning their defenses into three quadrants. Up here in Pineville, you have the Army of the Pines. Down here in Corrington, you have the bulk of their armed forces. Imagine a line running from the Cumberland Gap down to the south. Everybody to the west of that line is mustering in Corrington. Everybody to the east of that line musters in Pine, White Pine right down here. But they have one more trick up their Knoxvillian sleeves. This is called the Harlan Blitz. Two sleepy little towns up here, Harlan and Everts, enough to muster a reduced strength regiment of infantry and a regiment of regular horse. Instead of mustering in White Pine, Knoxville's leadership has ordered them to sweep north. They're going to tread for a day or two across the border and then lay siege to Big Stone Gap, and that is what we are going to focus on today. We're going to take a look at a couple of different ways, three different ways that you might run a siege of Big Stone Gap. We're also going to take a look at the 
ground truth terrain. Remember, these are real world places. You can go look at the actual valley for Big Stone Gap. You can see how large the town is. You can find the streams and the railroads. However, because this is 18-0-something, early 18-0-something, there are no railroads. We will allow for all of the bridges to be present. All of the roads, as you see, as we discussed, the interstates are improved roads. The state highways, US 321, for example, this is a poor road. And the white roads are considered countryside. You cannot move through the dark green, nor can you move along the light green. The only way to move on this map is via road. That means that this area up here is all no-go. Although, it is worth pointing out, you even have a fourth class of road treated as countryside. And when you move these armies around the map, you should consider not the distance between two towns, but the travel distance between two towns, this is a rough sketch. I use Google Maps to determine that Newport is only 20 miles from Greenville, but it is a 25-mile hike. Sneedville is fairly close to Middlesbrough, but it is a 41-mile hike because you have to cut through valleys and you have to back and forth through that. So we use actual distance traveled, not just distance across the map. And specifically... This is the issue with sending the Jones Army to Sneedville. They have to come down to the junction of 33 and 70, and then over to the west to get to Sneedville, which means by the time they get there, that 21 miles, the Army of Rogersville will already be in Bean Station. It's worth noting, on the 23rd, 24th, and 25th, rain set in. All of the armies were slowed down, including those mustering over here in the west. Stepping back, what we see is a large army back here for Knoxville. A fairly small army for the army of White Pine. What are we calling that? We've got the Army of the Pines. This is Army Group East, Army Group West, the Army of the Pines, and the Harlan Blitz. On this side, we've got Jones's army. Roger's army, and Green's army. The flags for Kingsport are taken from the counties in which each of those communities are located. The flags for Knoxville are basically built based on what would be easy to remember. See, there's Jefferson for Jefferson City. Of course, a white pine, and of course, a lightning bolt for the Blitz. That was originally Tazewell, you know, lightning for a taser, but... Turns out nobody's mustering in Tazewell. Well, that's not entirely true. There is another unit, and I do have a couple of spare red and blue markers in case there are other forces that we want to track. And there is a small force in Tazewell, six companies, 450 men, that will complicate the lives of the king's portions considerably. Because if this army moves off to fight the army of the Pines, who by this time... As we open up on September 28th, has moved down and crossed through the Cumberland Gap between Middlesbrough and the town whose name, Harrowgate, I finally remembered. Now that you're all up to speed, we'll mention one other thing. On the 29th, a light rain begins to fall. Army Group East sets out north for Morristown where Roger's army has set south from Bean Station. Where exactly these two armies meet is not entirely clear to me. You may want to take a look at this terrain. Look at the distance from White Pine and Bean Station. Who's going to get to Morristown first? Interestingly, the army of Knoxville, the army group east, has to be concerned about this Green Army up here. Now, Green's army has orders to hold in position until the results of a battle. So even though they are but a day's march away, they will not move from this until a victor is determined. In other words, the battle will be fought on the 29th. The siege will begin on the 29th. On the 30th, we will have a day of sorting out the dead, if you will. On the 30th, new orders will be issued from both Knoxville and Kingsport. Will this army be ordered north to defend Big Stone Gap and prevent 
the Harlan Blitz from laying siege to Kingsport? Will Green's army pull back up to here? It all depends on who wins and who loses these engagements. We'll talk about the fight for Morristown in the next video. For now, let's look at Big Stone Gap. As you can see, it is called a gap because it lies at the foot of a pass through this ridge right here. This is what it looks like today. Remember that the railroad has not been constructed. The Harlan Blitz is composed of one commander with an intelligence of 15, 17 initiative. Not too smart, not particularly driven. However, he is very brave and very well loved. He is not a particularly strong individual, nor is he particularly healthy. These numbers will become very important as we go through one of our versions of this siege. They have brought 600, a reduced strength. They only have four companies of men, 600 infantry. They also have the Everts First Lancers, 750 regular horse. Against them is just the militia. Now, now the Harlan Blitz is all regular soldiers. Big Stone Gap is a C-class community. They have 300 defenders. Those 300 defenders are outnumbered more than four to one. However, they are defending a narrow defile. We are going to walk through two different ways to run the siege of Big Stone Gap. The defenders will defend. We're going to do it using two different rule sets. We are going to use the Solo Wargaming Guide by William Sylvester. It looks a little something like this. And we're going to use Henry Hyde's Wargaming Campaigns. There we go. There is a third way to do this, and we'll talk about that one first. I don't know what the results of this third way are. Caleb Hines. You can find him on Twitter at, at sign Caleb Hines. That's Caleb with a C. He has taken a look and decided that the militia would be fools to wait south of the gap. They're going to march into the valley. And he took a look and he found this little... This little hollow right here. You can see it on the map. It is the perfect place for the a brave 300 to meet the barbarian hordes sweeping down from the north. And hopefully by sufficient time... Wow, does this sound familiar? For the armed forces down south to get their act together. When you shift the action to the tabletop, it looks a little something like this. Those weight of numbers for Knoxville mean very little in the narrow confines of the Big Stone Gap. This is an interesting wargaming scenario and not the kind of thing that you typically see on the tabletop. However... It becomes a typical sort of atypical engagement when you are doing a campaign. That's the tabletop way. The other way to do this is as recommended by old William Sylvester. And he's got a little process here for sieges. In which you, the invading army, Knoxville, waits until day five. And then we will cut the deck. And on day five, you draw a card. Now, oddly enough, hey, a little bit of recommendation for those of you that are designing war games of your own. It's called parallel construction. If you do day five and then day eight, these two tables should be reversed. On day five, you draw a card for the attacker and a card for the defender. Our attacker has ten. Food and ammunition last, last for the duration of the siege. The attacker is well prepared. The defender... Six, we'll run out of food after 21 days. So we'll have to make a note of that. This siege will last 21 days, at least as far as supply is concerned. On the eighth day, bear in mind, if you draw an ace, one or the other side runs out of food on day five. On the eighth day, you draw a card for health, one for the attacker. And on a five, the attackers are healthy. Those strapping young, in this case... We should point out, Harlan and Everts are in Kentucky. So those Kentucky mountain boys ain't worried about disease. And with an ace, smallpox breaks out. 5% casualties per day. The defenders will lose 15 men per day to smallpox. 
on day 10, now bear in mind, our siege has gone on for eight days at this point, they will have lost 30 soldiers, or 30 of their militiamen, to the siege. Then we have to worry about enlistment. We draw one, four, and we'll do the defender first, and then the attacker. One for the defender. The defender with a two, all the mercenaries, peasants, and militia desert after 10 days. Well, I don't know if that's 10 days from now, or if today is the 10th day. I believe it is the garrison surrenders after 50% casualties, the mercenaries, peasants, and militia, which in this case, it is only the militia defending. If we had regular troops, they would be okay. But in this case, on that day, the defenders surrender. We draw a queen for the attackers, and there's no effect on the siege. So on day 10, the siege will end. Very interesting. You just draw three cards, and you know that the siege lasts ten days. You have to now reverse the clock. That will be on October 9th. If they are left undisturbed and unmolested. In Wargaming Campaigns, Henry Hyde presents some of the all-time greats of the hobby, some of the guys who built the hobby. The Siege of Dendermon by Ron Miles. This fella took a couple of years to build a Vauban fort and took another year or so to, here's the whole write-up, to do a full-blown miniature war game siege. I would recommend doing this in 2 millimeter to speed things along. However, not all of us have that kind of resources, and we like to kind of move the campaign along. It's already going to take anywhere from 8 months to a year to complete this thing. So, fortunately for us... We don't have the resources to run a siege in miniature. Well, Henry provides March to Glory, campaign rules for all the ages. And one of those chapters, chapter 57, no, chapter 59, he provides suggestions for the determining the outcome of a siege. Now, he name checks Tony Bath, big props for that, and he tweaked it himself. He provides six different strategies that a besieging army might take to crack through the defender's defenses. Treachery, bad morale of the garrison commander, starvation, surprise, assault, and regular siege operations. Let's take a look at what that might look like here for the taking of Big Stone Gap. Notice that the Harlan Blitz, now this is why I read off that list of numbers for the, call it the character sheet, of the commander of the Harlan Blitz. This is going to be critical for determining how effective things are. In order to run this program, this algorithm, if you will, we needed a commander for Big Stone Gap. I rolled percentile dice six times. And what I found is that the commander is very smart. He has an intelligence of 79. But he doesn't have great initiative. He is not particularly ambitious from a military perspective. He is not particularly brave with a score of 28. He is very charismatic, Ah, he is smart and charismatic, but he is not particularly strong nor healthy. He is not a soldier's soldier. He is a political appointee. He has a total score, these numbers, of 256 to the commander of the Harlan Blitz of 273. Remember that that will come in, that will be very important. The other thing we need to look at here is, well, our ratio is going to be, well, how we, now, one of the things that Henry Hyde does, is he refers to campaign turns. And a campaign turn is a week for him. For us, it's a day. We're moving a little bit faster than that. The other thing he mentions is that he all, most of these rules are based on figure count, not body count. That means we need to talk about the ratio. How many figures, when he says figure, because we're not using figures, how many soldiers is that? And what I have settled on is to use the standard ratio of 1 to 20. In fact, that's the standard ratio that he name checks earlier in here. But if you're using figure ratios that are different, 1 to 33, 1 to 10, that, may, that will exert a big influence on how this siege works. So we're going to look at all of the various strategies that might be taken. The first, of course, is treachery. Now, for treachery, there are two things that have to happen. If your commander is very smart, and nobody in town likes him, 
then there's a chance he may give up the ship without a fight. That is not the case here. You need a charisma less than 40. And remember, my percentile die for the Big Stone Gap Commander came up with a charisma of 81. He is a Big Stone Gapian through and through. He will not go for treachery. No problem. So we check off down to cowardice. There is a chance when an army shows up that the commander is a coward and surrenders without a fight. That may be the case here. Bear in mind that his courage is a scant 28. If your courage, if your commander's courage is less than 40, you have to make a cowardice check. Is it must or may? Immediately a siege is declared, the garrison commander must pass a courage test. So we're going to roll percentile dice. Bear in mind that his courage is 28. On a 0 through 28, he passes. Remember, high numbers are good. On a 28 to 38, he surrenders honorably, meaning the militia are given honors of war. They basically are given parole. And on a 38 or higher, he surrenders unconditionally. That is where these extra numbers come in. So we'll roll. And look at that. With an 85, he unconditionally surrendered. Were I the one running this siege... The outcome would be unconditional surrender. Harlan Blitz moves right in. However, we're not running this siege. We're looking at all of the different strategies that you can opt for using Henry Hyde's book. The third is starvation. A siege must last six days at a minimum. However, the Blitz does not have time to waste like that. They want to move through as quickly as possible. Their goal is attacking Kingsport itself. Instead, they're going to launch a surprise attack. In this case, the Blitz commander makes an initiative check. This is a low probability of success. Remember, his initiative is only 17. He has to roll less than 17. On an 18 or better, they are they do not get surprised. So a 22, close, but no cigar. He must pass the test. So there's no surprise. The Big Stone Gap militia saw them coming a mile away. If you succeed, however, you have to roll 2d6, and we'll find out what happens. You are looking at essentially a 50-50 chance of succeeding with or without losses. Now, why would you take a 50-50 chance? Well, assaults are nasty business. Let's see if we rolled... Hey, look, we rolled a 12. We have achieved surprise. We rolled 2d6, and on a result of a 7, both sides lose 5%. That is a numbers game that plays in favor of the militia. They lose 15 men. The invaders lose 5% of 1,300 men. I'm not going to run the math right now. So we roll again on day two. And this time we roll a four. The attackers lose 25%. The defenders lose 10%. They were repulsed. So now they've lost 30% of their force to only 15 for the defenders. We roll an 8, inconclusive, 35 to 15. We roll a 9, successful. The attackers lose 10%. 45%, they are barely hanging together as a going concern. The defenders have lost about 40%, but in terms of raw numbers, this was terrible for the attackers. I would not recommend using surprise if you have the overwhelming weight of numbers. And now we're going to look at the process for when you do have the overwhelming weight process of numbers. Now we're going to tally up the number of figures on each side, and this is where the ratio becomes important. Because we're using 1 to 20, let's take a look here, with a ratio of 1 to 20, our attacker has a total of 68 figures. Multiply that by 5, you get a total score of 338. Because their commander is better, you add his full commander score to get a total of 611. The defender with only 300 men, and because he's the defender... Now, here's where it gets a little bit interesting. The attacker... Did I do this right? The attacker has regular infantry. He gets five points per regular infantry. It's a nice little chart. Let's take a look at that. Equivalent troops, the edge goes to the defenders. That factors in such things as we're behind a wall, we're higher up, we know the territory. Regular figures, 
infantry or cavalry, score five points for the attacker and eight points for the defender. In this case, we have regular infantry scoring five points of figure to only three points of figure because the defenders are militia. That's going to make a big difference as well. Why would a cavalryman be worth the same as an infantryman? On either side of the conflict, it turns out horses can't climb walls. Therefore, cavalrymen have to dismount in order to participate. We're going to look at this assault chart. It's a simple combat results chart, and it depends on the ratio of attacker to defender. Roll a simple d6. But first, we're going to actually look at this. Remember, we talked about the difference in the commander's score. Whichever commander has the higher score, in this case, that is the Harlan Blitz, by just a mere 23 points. That makes sense. Most commanders will have a score somewhere around 300. Since he has the advantage, we are going to start with a score of 273, and then we are going to apply those point factors, five points for every figure on the attack, three points for every figure on the defense, and it turns out with 68 figures, we have a total score of 611. 338 for the figures, 273 for the commander, 611. The final score for the defenders with a mere 10 figures, because remember, we have to divide by 20. That's not right. It should be 15. It's 45 to 600, which is still a 5 to 1 ratio. It's a better than 10 to 1 ratio, which is why you might want to attack with just 300 men. With 300 men, you still have a 10 to 1 ratio. You're still going to win. And whatever losses you take, you'll only take out of the 300. You'll still burn a day, but at least you have another option and another chance at going after them. If you are attacking with terrible odds, three to two, three attackers for every two defenders, there is only a one in six chance that you will storm the position and you will lose the same strength as the garrison. Meaning, two-thirds of your force will be wiped out. We are going to be rolling on the five to one, which you'll notice has a single repulse and then it is merely varying degrees of casualties. We roll a d6 for the attacker. And we get a result of a six. The position is stormed. The garrison is lost. The attackers lose just 20% of the garrison strength. Remember, 300 men. For every man they lose, for every 100, that's 20. Our Harlan Blitz would result in the loss of 60 men. And I would use the same ratio that I always use for these. Of the 60, 30 will be infantry, 30 will be cavalry, 15 will be dead, and 15 will be injured for two weeks. You now have 30 injured in your back train. You may need to send them back, bring our map, to Everts along the long and twisty path. They may be out of the campaign for good, but you still have 400... Uh, what is it, 540 infantry to run down to Duffield, which is a Class A town. You do not besiege Class A towns. You move in, you spend a day consolidating power, and then you move on to Gate City. More importantly, by taking Big Stone Gap, the Harlan Blitz maintains their supply line. And perhaps you decide, maybe what we rule is, that they now have a week's worth of supplies. They have to get to Duffield and take Duffield within a week. Simply done. But we have to track supplies now. They can get a week's supply of Duffield. They are living off the land. They have to march to Gate City and down to Kingsport, which is a capital city, which would be a tough nut to crack. But if they can lay siege to Kingsport and just hang out for two weeks, they may be able to end this campaign immediately. Or, alternatively, they may move down to Rogersville, which would break the supply line of... The army of, of, which army is this? The army of Jonesville. So a lot going on up there. And that is on the exact same day that this fight for Morristown is set to go off. We'll talk about that in our next video. Before I take my leave, there is one last thing I should point out. The slow conditions for Kingsport. The morale boost 
that Knoxville received. They gave all of their boys a signing bonus. That expired on the 28th. That will not be a factor in the battle on the 29th, nor was it a factor in the siege we just ran. Tomorrow, on the 30th, new orders will be issued, and we will roll for new surprise conditions. I'm going to wait until we've resolved this battle first before I do that. And we'll do that live, perhaps on a YouTube short, just because it doesn't take much time to do that. So look for that coming up soon. Until then, I'm praying for you.